Have you ever looked at water with and without sunglasses on? Well, if those sunglasses are polarized, you might be able to see underneath the water a bit better. And here's why. When light strikes the water, it bounces off, causing that glare. But if we have, these are my wife's sunglasses, if we have polarized sunglasses, they have slits in them, little scratches, that only allows the vertical light to come through. And the horizontal light that's bouncing off the water, it gets blocked. Uh, let me show you up close what I mean. Here we're taking a look at my sunglasses and they're polarized so they're only allowing the vertical light waves to come through, all the reflections bouncing off the pool. Those horizontal waves are being filtered out. Now here are my wife's sunglasses also polarized and you see that we can see through both of these lenses. Even if I overlap the lenses, sure it's a little bit darker but uh, we can still see the water through those two lenses. Here's where it gets interesting though. What if I rotate her glasses 90 degrees. Now, instead of letting vertical light through, it's letting horizontal light through. And if I overlap these two lenses, one allowing just vertical light waves and one allowing just horizontal light waves, here's what happens. Look at this. Notice that in the overlapping portion, we see nothing. It's completely blocked out. This effect is called polarization. And this concept of polarization plays a role in Wi-Fi networks. We can have signals transmitted at different angles and they don't interfere with one another. That's one of the secrets that allows us to transmit data at a higher rate using Wi-Fi networks. In fact, in this video, we're gonna take a look at our three most recent and popular Wi-Fi standards, 802.11n, AC and the brand new AX, sometimes called Wi-Fi 6. But uh, it's getting a little bit toasty out here by the pool, so let's hop into the studio and take a look at these different wireless standards and some of the uh, enhanced mechanisms they have that make them so fast. Okay, let's take a look at some of the modern wireless standards and how they work. And when I say modern, I thought we'd go back as far as 2009. That's when the IEEE 802.11n standard was released. Now, yes, there are older standards like B and A and G, but I want you to know and study these specific standards. These are the ones that are most popular today. And in this video, we're gonna talk about the magic behind how they work and how we can achieve different speeds. The first thing I want you to understand though is when we're communicating on a wireless network, we're using one of two frequency bands the 2.4 gigahertz frequency band or the 5 gigahertz frequency band. And you see on screen that .11n could use either one or both. .11ac can use just the 5 gigahertz band and uh, the brand new 802.11ax, also known as Wi-Fi 6, that can use either band as well. And look at the bandwidths. We're going from 150 megabits per second of theoretical maximum throughput, and we know we don't reach theoretical maximums, but we're approaching 150 megabits per second with .11n, all the way up to a whopping 9.6 gigabits per second with Wi-Fi 6 or 802.11ax. And the transmission methods in .11n and .11ac are both OFDM. We're gonna be talking about that. That's gonna go back to that discussion we had with the sunglasses next to the pool. And there's an enhancement to OFDM called OFDMA that's being used by Wi-Fi 6, and we'll check that out. But let's go back in time just a little bit to set the stage. If we go back all the way to .11b, .11b used something called direct sequence spread spectrum where a channel was 22 megahertz in size and a single stream of communication would occupy the entire 22 megahertz channel. And while that might sound great, the way the error detection and recovery had to work, it wasn't really efficient. It's actually mathematical preferable to break this one big channel up into multiple channels. We're gonna go from direct sequence spread spectrum to frequency division multiplexing. Here, we're just using a 20 megahertz of that channel instead of 22 megahertz. And instead of allowing a single communications flow to occupy the full 20 megahertz channel, we're gonna break it down into sub channels. And there's actually more sub channels that I drew on the screen. This is for illustrative purposes only, but we're breaking this down into different sub channels. Here's the challenge with this. 
these subchannels are so close together that we don't want one channel to interfere with another channel. And if they're just right next to each other, they very well could interfere. We talked about sunglass polarization allowing just the vertical wavelengths of light. And if we turned it 90 degrees, that would allow the horizontal wavelengths of light. Well, we can do something very similar here. Every time we go from one channel to the other, we can polarize the direction of that next channel. Here's what I mean. When you get into electromagnetic field theory, you learn that the electric field and the magnetic field are perpendicular to one another. There's a 90 degree separation. And the term you might have heard in a math class is orthogonal. Orthogonal simply means that we're at right angles to one another. So what we can do is combine this concept of being orthogonal with the concept of frequency division multiplexing, and that gives us orthogonal frequency division multiplexing. I know that might sound like a complicated term, but it really means that we are separating different channels into different frequencies frequency division multiplexing, and to make sure the channels don't interfere with one another, we're just angling each subsequent transmission at a 90 degree separation from the previous transmission, just like the lenses were doing. We can send one transmission vertically using the electric field, and then the next transmission, the next subchannel, it can be sent horizontally using the magnetic field. That's going to give us isolation of those subchannels where one doesn't interfere with another. But let's take this concept of shifting angles a little bit further. What if we could shift not just 90 degrees, but what if we could shift a specific number of degrees, like 6 degrees or 16 degrees? What if we could angle our transmissions, in other words? In antenna theory, we can actually angle the transmission of our radio waves. Something else we can modify is the amplitude or the power. How tall is that wave? So let's say we did something like this. What if we created a grid and we identified for simplicity, let's say just 16 different dots on that grid and we could angle a waveform and adjust its amplitude, adjust its power. In other words, adjust its height so that it hits one of those dots. And when we hit one of those dots, we have, in this case, 16 different possible values. We could represent four binary bits. So if I were to hit that dot in the upper left-hand corner, instead of just saying, here's a wave and it means a binary one or a binary zero, look at this. Suddenly, it means four binary digits. It means 1011. This is going to allow us to communicate a lot more binary data with fewer waveforms. It's a lot like throwing darts at a dartboard. If we hit different spots on that dartboard, there are different numbers associated with those different spots. Same thing here. And in this example, we've got 16 dots and we said that represented four bits. That's because two raised to the power of four is 16. And this is called 16 QAM, Q-A-M. That's Quadrature Amplitude Modulation. And it gives us 16 different targets in what's called a constellation. It's called a constellation because it starts to look sort of like a star field once you get more and more dots in the constellation. But here, just to make it easy to visualize, we're just using 16 QAM, and that's going to represent four bits. But our Wi-Fi technologies, they take it a step further. Instead of just having 16 dots in their constellation, 802.11n uses 64 QAM. How many bits does it take to give us 64 different possibilities? Six. So if we hit a target on that dartboard in that constellation, we're communicating with a single waveform, we're communicating six bits. Now, it gets harder and harder to have more dots in the constellation because we have to be more accurate. What if we are a little bit off? Which dot did we mean to hit? We didn't hit anyone exactly. But as the circuitry has improved in our wireless gear, we've been able to become more and more accurate. In fact, 802.11ac uses 256 QAM. There, when we hit one of those dots, we're communicating eight bits. And the 802.11ax standard, that is 1,024 QAM. That communicates 10 bits by hitting a very specific star in that constellation, a very specific point. That's one of the ways that speeds have increased over the years with these different wireless standards. And we talked about having a wireless channel of 20 megahertz. What we can do to give us a wider channel to send more information is we can combine these 20 megahertz channels. We could combine a couple of them to have a 40 megahertz channel. And that's possible with 802.11n. And with .11ac and with .11ax, 
We can go further. We could combine four channels to give us an 80 megahertz channel width. We could even combine eight channels to give us a 160 megahertz channel width. Yet another way that with increasing channel widths, we get more speed. So we're starting to see why .11 AC and .11 AX, why they're so fast. Something else that was actually introduced with .11n, but it got better in subsequent versions, is beamforming. With beamforming, instead of just radiating out a wireless signal in all directions, we can actually focus the transmission towards a particular wireless client. There's a back and forth communication that goes on, and the access point can literally point towards that wireless client and focus the energy there for the transmission going to that specific wireless client. And the way that's possible is by using multiple waveforms. When you have two waveforms that are overlapping, if you have the high points of the waveform intersecting, then the combined waveform is twice as high. If you have waveforms that are opposite of one another, they're 180 degrees out of phase in other words, you get silence. That's the way those noise cancellation headphones work. Have you ever been on an airplane and used one of those noise cancellation headphones where there's a microphone in the headphone and it's listening to the background engine noise and what it's doing is shifting that background engine noise by 180 degrees. It's basically flipping it upside down. And when you hear that upside down noise on top of the actual noise, you get silence. That's how you can cancel out a wave. Well, by using that constructive and destructive interference, we can point to our various wireless clients. And again, this concept of beamforming was originally introduced in .11n, but it got a lot better in .11ac, and it continues to get better in .11ax. Something else that can increase our speeds is MuMimo. MuMimo stands for multi-user, multiple input, multiple output. Basically, we're talking about having multiple antennas inside of our access point. Back in .11n, we had what was called one spatial stream. I could send one stream at a time. If I needed to talk from this access point to both wireless clients, I would first have to send my signal to the top wireless client, and then I could send my signal to the bottom wireless client. But with .11ac and .11ax, we can have multiple antennas that simultaneously send out transmissions to our multiple clients. Just as an easy example to visualize, let's say we're using two spatial streams here. I'm communicating to both wireless clients simultaneously. And .11n can only send one spatial stream at a time. .11ac can do four. But here's the catch. If it's sending traffic out to four devices, that's downstream only. .11ac is not able to receive traffic from four devices simultaneously. That's a huge improvement with .11ax. Here, we can have eight spatial streams, and it's both upstream and downstream, upload and download at the same time. It's like we're going from half duplex to full duplex. Now let's talk about some of the other advantages of 802.11ax. Here we see an example of a Wi-Fi 6 Cisco access point. And one feature of Wi-Fi 6 or .11ax is it's got a feature called target wake time or TWT. This gives us what is called deterministic access to the network. The access point literally tells the clients when they are allowed to transmit and receive. They don't just have access to transmit anytime they want. They're given a schedule. And this might sound like a bad thing. This goes back to the days of the old token ring Ethernet debate where token ring was deterministic and they said, we're not going to collide. And Ethernet says, but we don't have to wait. We can get to the network whenever we want to. There was that whole big debate back in the 90s and Ethernet obviously won that debate. But it's kind of the same thing going on here. This is deterministic access. Our clients cannot talk anytime they want to. They're not using the basic CSMA-CA access that wireless clients typically use. They're being told when to transmit and receive. And in higher density environments, this is actually proven to be a good thing. It gives us less latency because there's less contention for transmission time slots and there's less collisions. So it reduces latency overall, especially in higher density environments. And it gives us power savings. Because the client's radio knows that it cannot transmit or receive right now, it's not its time, it can power down a little bit. And it can save power until its time comes around and then it applies power and it does its transmission and reception. So it gives us reduced latency and power savings. 
Something else we have is BSS coloring. BSS, that's basic service set, that refers to the MAC address of an access point. And if we're in a higher density environment and we've got multiple access points, maybe with overlapping or different SSIDs that are communicating on the same channel, it can be kind of hard for a client to know which access point it's communicating with, but it can make sure that it's talking to its specific access point on its specific SSID, which is the wireless network name, using this concept of BSS coloring. It's almost like tagging a frame on a VLAN to say you're a member of VLAN 100. Well, here we're essentially coloring or tagging these wireless transmissions to say you're associated with this SSID on this access point with this MAC address. That's BSS coloring. And this technology where an access point is actually controlling a client's access to the network, that's an enhancement to OFDM, orthogonal frequency division multiplexing. Now we have orthogonal frequency division multiple access, where we have different devices that we can communicate with at the same time on multiple antennas, upload and download. We're telling those devices when they can and cannot transmit. We're doing coloring of the transmission so that they can keep talking to the access point they want to talk with. And of course, we're using that 1024 qualm. We can do eight spatial streams. It all adds up to more bandwidth, which takes us back to our original slide. We see that the 802.11ax, so the Wi-Fi 6 standard, has a theoretical throughput of 9.6 gigabits per second quite a leap forward from 150 megabits per second of dot 11n and we've seen in this video some of the technologies that make these speeds possible we've talked about things such as beamforming and mumimo we talked about ofdm versus ofdma and we threw a few darts at a board with qualm quadrature amplitude modulation Hey, it's Kevin again, and if you enjoyed that video, that video is just one of over 200 videos that I'm doing in my brand new CCNA course to get people ready for next year's CCNA exam that comes out February the 24th. I'm actually releasing the course sometime this November, so you can start studying right away. If you want to be notified when that course comes out, just go to the link below and I'll send you an email as soon as it's available.